Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. It's been about three weeks since we posted a video, although there have been a couple radio interviews posted. And um, that doesn't mean that we haven't been busy here at Fairwinds. Uh, I've been doing expert witness testimony, but more importantly, Maggie and, and Kevin Hurley have been very busy converting fairwinds.com to fairwinds.jp, which will be a Japanese translation of our, our website. I, I'd like to thank a, a large group of dedicated Japanese speakers who've worked with us in translating all these videos into Japanese. And note that today is the first day that uh, fairwinds.jp and fairwinds.com will be um, will be broadcasting the same material. Thank you very much to those volunteers. In the last several months, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission initiated a, a, a review of safety as a result of the Fukushima accident. They just published their report and several key areas that they wanted uh, to, to look at in more depth. That report is on our website. And, uh, but more importantly, the Union of Concerned Scientists acting as a watchdog over the NRC has written a, um, a critique of that initial Nuclear Regulatory Commission report. I, we posted that Union of Concerned Scientists critique as well on the site. And there's important lessons that the NRC has identified, but more importantly, there's important issues that the Union of Concerned Scientists has recognized where the NRC really needs to put their money where their mouth is and um, not just study safety issues, but actually implement safety changes. Well, today, what I'd like to talk about are four things that are not in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission report that I really think should be in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission report. They are the containment, the reactor, the explosion, and the last thing called severe accident mitigation analysis. The first thing is the containment on this boiling water reactor and the 35 other boiling water reactors that are exactly like that. Back in February, about three weeks before the accident, Maggie and I were walking and, and Maggie said, you know, we're doing a lot of expert reports. We find a lot of problems. Where do I think the next accident might occur? And, and I told her, I said, I don't know where the next accident will occur, but I know for sure it's going to be in a Mark I boiling water reactor containment. Well, that's what the Fukushima reactors were, Mark I containments. This picture of a boiling water reactor containment is, a, is taken in the early 70s. It was taken at Browns Ferry, but it's identical to the Fukushima reactors. Now, let me walk you through that as, we, um, as I talk about it. There's uh, two pieces to the containment. The top looks like an upside down light bulb, and that's called a dry well. Inside there is where the nuclear reactor is. Down below is this thing that looks like a donut, and that's called the torus, and that's filled almost all the way with water. The theory is that if the reactor breaks, steam will shoot out through the light bulb into the donut, creating lots of bubbles which will reduce the pressure. Well, this thing's called a pressure suppression containment. Now, at the bottom of that picture is the lid for the containment. When it's fully assembled, that lid sits on top. The containment's about an inch thick. Inside it is the nuclear reactor that's about eight inches thick, and we'll get to that in a minute. Well, this reactor containment was designed in the early 70s, late 60s, and by 1972, a lot of people had concerns with the containment. I wanted to read to you a Nuclear Regulatory Commission memo from 1972 that talks about the problems of this pressure suppression containment. Steve's idea to ban the pressure suppression containment scheme is an attractive one. 
However, the acceptance of pressure suppression containments by all elements of the nuclear field, including regulatory and the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, is firmly embedded in the conventional wisdom. Reversal of this hollowed policy, especially at this time, could well lead to the end of nuclear power. It would throw into question the operation of licensed plants, and it would generally create more turmoil than I can stand. So in the early 70s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission recognized this containment design was flawed. In the mid-70s, they realized the forces were in the wrong direction. Instead of down, they were up, and large straps were put into place. Well then, in the 80s, there was another problem that developed. After Three Mile Island, engineers began to realize that this containment could explode from a hydrogen buildup. That hadn't been factored into the design in the 70s either. But what they came up with for this particular containment was a vent in the side of it. Now, a vent is designed to let the pressure out, and a containment is designed to keep the pressure in. So rather than contain this radioactivity, engineers realized that if the containment were to survive an explosion, they'd have to open a hole in the side of it called a containment vent. Well, these vents were added in the late 1980s. And they weren't added because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission demanded it. What the industry did to avoid that was create an initiative, and they put them in voluntarily. Now, that sounds really proactive, but in fact, it wasn't. If the Nuclear Regulatory Commission required it, it would have opened up the license on these plants to citizens and scientists who had concern. Well, by having the industry voluntarily put these vents in, it did two things. One, it did not allow any public participation in the process to see if they were safe. And the second thing is that it didn't, um, it, it didn't allow the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to look at these vents and say that they were safety related. In fact, it sidetracked the process entirely. Well, these vents were um, never tested until Fukushima. This containment was never tested until Fukushima. And it failed three times out of three tries. In retrospect, we shouldn't be surprised. Looking at the procedures for opening these vents in the event electricity fails, requires someone fully clad in radiation gear to go down to an enormous valve in the bowels of the plant and turn the crank 200 times to open it. Now, can you imagine in the middle of a nuclear accident with steam and explosions and radiation, expecting an employee to go into the plant and turn a valve 200 times to open it? So that was the second Band-Aid fix that failed on a containment that 40 years earlier was designed too small. Well, with all this in mind, I think we really need to ask the question, should the Mark I containment even be allowed to continue to operate? The NRC's position is, well, we can make the vents stronger. I don't think that's a good idea. Now, all of those issues that I just talked about are related to the Mark I containment. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the reactor that sits inside that containment. So that light bulb and that donut are the containment structure. Inside that is where the nuclear reactor is. Now, on a boiling water reactor, the nuclear control rods come in at the bottom. On a pressurized water reactor, they come in from the top. All of the reactors at Fukushima, and 35 in the world in, in this design, have control rods that come in from the bottom. Now, that poses a unique problem and an important difference that the NRC is not looking at right now. If the core melts in a pressurized water reactor, there's no holes in the bottom of the nuclear reactor, and it's a very thick, eight to 10 inch piece of metal that the nuclear reactor core would have to melt through. But that didn't happen at Fukushima. Fukushima was a boiling water reactor. It's got holes in the bottom. 
Now when the nuclear core lies on the bottom of a boiling water reactor like Fukushima or the ones in the US or others in Japan, it's easier for the core to melt through because of those 60 holes in the bottom of the reactor. It doesn't have to melt through 8 inches of steel. It just has to melt through a very, very thin walled pipe and scoot out the hole in the bottom of the nuclear reactor. I'm not the only one to recognize that holes at the bottom of a boiling water reactor are a problem. Last week an email came out that was written by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission right after the Fukushima accident where they recognize that if there's a core meltdown and it's now lying as a blob on the bottom of the nuclear reactor, these holes in the bottom of the reactor form channels through which the, the hot molten fuel can get out a lot easier and a lot quicker than the thick pressurized water reactor design. Now this is a flaw in any boiling water reactor and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not recognizing that the likelihood of melting through a boiling water reactor like Fukushima is a lot more significant than the likelihood of melting through a pressurized water reactor. The third area is an area we've discussed in depth in a previous video and that's that the explosion at Unit 3 was a detonation, not a deflagration. It has to do with the speed of the shock wave. The shock wave at Unit 3 traveled faster than the speed of sound. And that's an important distinction that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the entire nuclear industry is not looking at. A containment can't withstand a shock wave that travels faster than the speed of sound. Yet all containments are designed assuming that doesn't happen. At Fukushima 3, it did happen. And we need to understand how it happened and mitigate against it in the future on all reactors. Now, I measured that. I scaled the size of the building versus the speed at which the uh, explosion occurred. And I can determine that that shockwave traveled at around 1,000 feet per second. The speed of sound is around 600 feet per second, so it traveled at supersonic speeds that can cause dramatic damage to a containment. They're not designed to handle it. Yet the NRC is not looking at that. So we've got three key areas where the um, NRC and the nuclear industry don't want people to look. And that's should this Mark I containment even be allowed to continue to operate? Two, are boiling water reactors more prone to a melt through than a pressurized water reactor? And the third is, can containments withstand a detonation shockwave? If the nuclear industry wants to implement a safety change, they have to do something called a cost-benefit analysis. Now what that means is the cost to implement the change in the power plant has to be exceeded by the benefits to society if the, if the change is made. This brings me to the last point today, which is called SAMA, S-A-M-A, and it stands for Severe Accident Mitigation Analysis. It uses a really fancy computer code that calculates exactly what the costs are to society in the event of a big accident. And those costs are in terms of human life and they're in terms of uh, damages to property. Now the computer code is, um, is wrong. It's been known to have been wrong for a long time, but it continues to be in use. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission puts the lowest possible value on a human life of any of the agencies in Washington. And the cleanup after an accident is also artificially low. So the net effect is that when a cost to make a modification is compared against the benefits to society, this computer code distorts the benefits and lowers them. So it appears that there's no need to make the change because the costs are too high and the benefits to you and I and society are too low. Fukushima has taught us that that's just not true. 
The costs to clean up Fukushima are going to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, U.S., at least $200 billion. And yet this computer code that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses never, ever calculates a high number like that. Unless we adjust the cost-benefit analysis, what will happen is as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission identifies problems that should be corrected, their own computer code will show that it's not justified, that the risks to society are really too low and we don't need to spend that money. The problem is in the computer code. And until we upwardly adjust the cost of a human life and the cost of damaged property, we won't be able to come up with an effective way of judging the costs and the benefits of these safety modifications. Well, that about sums it up. There's at least three key areas that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and nuclear industry, both in Japan and in the United States, are not looking at. Containment design, boiling water reactor vessels, and detonation shock waves. But no matter what they look at, if they don't do the cost-benefit analysis right and properly evaluate the cost to society, none of these changes will be implemented. Well, again, I'd like to thank our Japanese viewers and welcome them to fairwinds.jp and also to thank all of our viewers over the last 170 days and thank them for watching fairwinds.com.